Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to Daybreak. The psalmist in Psalm 9 verses 2 says, I'll praise you, Lord, with all my heart and declare all your wondrous deeds. Yes, dear friends, acknowledging his wonderful deeds, let's praise and worship him with the choir. sure today's praise and worship lifted our hearts towards heavenly experience. Let us now pay attention to today's message. Good morning to you. May the love of Jesus fill your heart your lives and your home. Like always, I want to start with a question. You're a Christian, right? You know Jesus. You've experienced him. You've read about him. When was the last time you talked about him? No, I really mean, when was the last time you really talked about Jesus to someone? You know, your neighbor, a colleague at work, you know, a friend in school or college? When did you talk about Jesus the last time? Kind of hard to figure out when we did that, right? Now, 
we have to come to terms with this. We are Christians. We have a mission. The mission is simple. That we experience the goodness of God and bring it to the world. Or else the world is never going to know about God or about Jesus for that matter. Someone said beautifully once that Jesus did not command the whole world to go to church. Jesus commanded his church to go out to the whole world. Now, don't stop going to church. You still have to go to church. But then, you go to church and what do you do with it? Do you bring the church out to the world? I'm reminded of a story, you know. A uh, long time back, uh, a man named John Stroman wrote a little book called God's Downward Mobility. In it, he talks about two friends one of them, Nathan Williams, a Jew. He had a Catholic friend, Robbie by name. One day, Nathan and Robbie go out on a Sunday morning for a breakfast in a small little eatery. Just as they're having breakfast, Nathan asks Robbie, hey Robbie, what are you doing today? And Robbie says, eh, nothing much, not planned anything for the day. He says, how about a round of golf? And Robbie says, sure, sure. And then he suddenly remembers, well, wait a minute, it's Sunday. He says, so what, Sunday, you know, it's a good day to play golf. The sun's out and bright. So Robbie says, well, Sunday is a day I go to church. So Nathan says, oh, you don't have to go to church. And Robbie takes offense at that and says, how can you say that? I've always gone to church. I've gone to church from the time I was a kid. My parents brought me to church. I've never really missed a mass on Sunday. I go to church every Sunday. And Nathan looks at Robbie and says, Robbie, going to church is not really important. Listen to me, he says. You and I have been friends for 34 years. We have traveled the world. We have gone places. We have holidayed together. We have attended numerous board meetings. We have gone to the best of restaurants across the world. You have invited me to all the functions and the parties at your place and I have invited you to every event in my family. We have never missed each other's important events, be it in our family or in our personal lives. Robbie, if going to Mass was important for you and if it was an important part of your life, why have you not invited me to go to Mass? So what if I am a Jew? It's your important bit in your life and you would have wanted to share that important bit with me but you never did. Robbie, don't lie to me. Church is not important. If it was important, you would have introduced me to your church and to your God. Robbie reflects on that and says, Oh my Lord, ain't it right? I never really talk about God. I never really talk about what's beautiful about my faith. I never really talk about Jesus. All I do is talk about a good restaurant, I talk about a good picnic spot, I talk about a good movie, I talk about a good book, but I don't talk about my good experience with my Jesus. It's time you and I began to talk about what's beautiful about our relationship with Jesus, what's beautiful about our God, what's beautiful about the nature of our experience, of our relationship with this wonder God of ours, Jesus. Jesus calls us today to talk about him. Evangelization is a big word, but we are actually called to witness Christ's love. Have you experienced Christ's love in your life? Have you shared that with others? Have you listened to Christ and felt comforted deep within your troubled heart? Have you shared that with others? Have you laughed your heart out loud and smiled graciously because you've experienced a soothing peace that comes from the presence of Jesus in your life? Have you shared that with someone else? Have you experienced a quiet moment in church where you have found profound and an unshakable peace? Have you gone out and invited someone to experience that? How selfish have you been? It's time you and I shared Jesus with the world. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Like someone said, Jesus did not command the whole world to go to church. He commanded his church, you and me, to go out to the whole world. What are you waiting for? Go. Go. 
go bring Jesus to the world. Have a great day. God bless you. Certainly, today's message has given us new insights for reflection. Our church is blessed with many who led exemplary lives and became saints. Let us now look at the life of the saint the church venerates today. Queen of Germany and wife of King Henry I was the daughter of Count Dietrich and Reinhild of Denmark. She was born about 895 and was raised by her grandmother, the abbess of Erfurt convent, where she developed a taste for prayer and spiritual reading. She married Henry, Duke of Saxony, who became King of Germany in 919. Henry encouraged Matilda to use the resources of his kingdom for works of charity. Matilda spent little time with her husband as he spent most of his time at war. As queen, her court was pious, quiet and intellectual, more like a convent than a seat of royal power. She was widowed in the year 936 and supported her son Henry's claim to his father's throne. When her son Otto the Great was elected, she persuaded him to name Henry Duke of Bavaria after he led an unsuccessful revolt. Saint Matilda was known for her considerable almsgiving. She was severely criticized by both Otto and Henry for what they considered her extravagant gifts to charities. Matilda eventually turned over her dower inheritance to her sons and settled on her estates in Saxony. She was later recalled to the court through the intercession of Otto's wife Edith. Matilda was welcomed back to the palace and her sons asked for her forgiveness. In her final years, she devoted herself to the building of many churches, convents and monasteries. She spent most of the declining years of her life at the convent she had built at Nordhausen. She died at the monastery at Quedlinburg on March 14th and was buried there with her late husband Henry. For her devotion and charity to the poor, Queen Matilda of Saxony was canonized shortly after her death. Let us pray. O God, by whose grace the blessed Matilda, enkindled with the fire of thy love, became a burning and a shining light in thy church. Grant that we may be inflamed with the same spirit of discipline and love and ever walk before thee as children of light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. After looking at the life of this saint, are you not inspired to lead a holy life? Yes, Lord, it is your word that gives us light in moments of troubles and darkness. Let us now listen to today's message. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, welcome to the Daily Bread, a daily reflection on the word of God. As we are in the season of Lent, we make some Lenten reflections based on the Bible passages suggested by the Latin Rite liturgy. Today we are given as food for our soul a reading from the first letter of Peter, chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. 
So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Tent the flock of God that is in your charge, not by constraint but willingly, not for shameful gain but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd is manifested, you will obtain the unfading crown of glory. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, Lent is a time to reflect, to rethink, evaluate, examine our lives. And especially today, reading asks us to reflect our life as a community, the role of leadership is presented today. It's the basis and purpose of authority is presented here. Peter, chosen by God, Jesus Christ, as the leader of the church, as the rock on which he wanted to build his church. And now he's advising, exhorting the community. So we know the letter of Peter belonged to the collection called the Catholic Epistles. It's not addressed to any particular community, it is addressed to the Catholic Church, the entire world. And here, in this particular passage, the focus is on leadership. And this leadership is that of a pastor, a shepherd. The term shepherd is very familiar to the Jews, to the Israelites, who were shepherds by profession, by their life, nomadic shepherds. And all their fathers and leaders were also shepherds, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd as well as the first king. David was a shepherd. But shepherd is a leader. And there are types of leadership. And here Peter is focusing on four characteristics of leadership. The first, the leaders are appointed by God. You are appointed by God. You don't become a leader. You don't, it's not something that you eagerly take for. God has put you in charge of it. So leadership is given by God. As Moses was a leader, as Aaron was leader, and there was a lot of struggle against Moses and Aaron in the desert. So there is struggle for leadership. You should be careful. A leader is appointed by God. Respect and responsibility of the leader. God has put the flock, the people in charge of the leader. And so the leader should be considered by the flock as a leader assigned by God, and the leader should consider himself as a servant of God in the service of the people. The second, the leader should be willingly leading the people, not because somebody has forced him, a willing, peaceful leadership. Because he has been instituted by God, so God has given him the, the duty, and this service of the people should be a pleasant task. Even though difficult, should be willingly done, not because of the force of anybody else. No constraint, but free. And the third, the third characteristic of the leadership should be that of service, not domination. Jesus said, you shall not be like the pagans. The Gentiles, the, the ones who have authority, consider the lords, the masters, ruling over the people, crushing the people, dominating, suppressing, oppressing. Not that. You should be like servants. Jesus gave us an example by kneeling before the disciples and washing their feet and wiping it. And then he said, if you call me Lord and Master, that's okay. I am your Lord and your Master. But if I, who am your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Not as a theatrical performance once a year, but as an attitude. Attitude of servant leadership. That's what Peter is telling. Not as a not as a domineering thing, but as a servant. And finally, this should be done with the hope. The, you should not expect anything in return from the flock, from the people whom you are leading. It should be agape, you do it for their good. But at the same time, you will be rewarded in heaven. God will reward you. A leader who is hopeful. As Moses was rewarded by God, as leading the people to the promised land, the leader should be taking care only of the people, but at the same time be hopeful of the reward. Now the question, what does it mean to us? Everybody has some kind of a leadership. 
a father, a mother is a leader in the family. An elder brother or sister is a leader to the younger ones. A teacher in the school or a political leader, a ecclesiastical leader, everybody has some kind of a task, somebody who has to take care of. So all have been entrusted with some kind of a leadership and we have to be careful, we have to watch carefully what type of leadership we are using, practicing, not for gain, not to have dominion over others, only for the good. And I am the servant of servants of God. That's how the Pope is um, telling himself, describing himself or explaining himself, the servant of the servants of God. Jesus has given us a servant leadership and so should be all the leaders, the popes and cardinals and bishops and priests, nuns and all the people in the church as well as in the society. This kind of leadership is what God expects of us. Let us ask the Lord for a grace to practice such a leadership and also pray for our leaders that they be inspired by this servant leadership prescribed by the scripture. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, our, as our model, our pastor. I am the good shepherd, he said. Lord Jesus, you loved us and you gave yourself up for us. Enable us and all our leaders to be a leader like you. We make this prayer to the Father through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sure today's daily bread has given you new insights to ponder over. As we come to the end of this episode of Daybreak, let us once again thank the Lord with this hymn. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to this side. Love and strength for each new day, He will make a way, He will make a way. God will make a way, where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see.
sure the last half an hour has really been a blessing to you. Till we meet again, stay blessed.